Hey, what is going on there? Bring Me the Horizon just released a new track called Amen that's featuring Daryl from Glassjaw, which I'm a huge Glassjaw fan, and also Lil Uzi Vert. Now, being a scientist and also someone who mixes music, I thought it'd be fun to do an in-depth dissection of this track so you can see all the mixing and producing nuances and details that went into making this song what it is. This track was mixed by Zach Cervini, so I'm really going to dive into the mix to try to understand and reverse engineer what he's doing to make the song hit so hard. All right, so here is the track that I pulled straight out of iTunes Music. I hope you have fun. It's heavy. It's like the first heavy Bring Me The Horizon song I've heard in like three years or something like that. Now, something I want to immediately point out to everybody, because this is always a topic of discussion on the internet, is the loudness war. This track is loud. It's super loud. Let me show you how insanely loud this is. So we're sitting at like minus four, minus five LUFS. So I think iTunes wants you to send music at minus 14 or they're going to turn it down. Guys, I'm telling you, it doesn't matter the loudness of your music. Just make it sound good. Don't sacrifice the song just to lower the loudness target. It's so important. Zach's not worrying about it. A lot of these other pop, rock, and metal producers are not worrying about it. And I don't think you should either. That aside, let's jump into some of the more details of this mix. So there is some very audible, uh, like clipping distortion that I can hear. And that's probably just an artifact of making the song that loud, but it's done so tastefully, right? It doesn't sound distracting or annoying. It's just makes it feel more angry and aggressive. Like you're turning this song up super, super loud. Uh, but there's still a lot of punch in the kick and snare drum, which is so important in this genre. Otherwise it just doesn't have any life. And I just like that he's got a ton of bass in his mixes because that's what I feel like rock and metal was missing for like a decade. Alright, so something that's really interesting that I just happened to catch is if you... Let me get rid of this window. Do you notice in the waveform here, we have these little spikes down? They align with the drum transients, the snare and the kick drum. Watch. What does that tell us? That tells us that the kick drums and the snare, the drum transients, all these little tiny spikes down, I think are controlling the pumping and the movement of the mix on the mastering stage. So if we look, let's go find a kick drum. So here's a kick drum sample. We know that because the waveform is really big, it just tells us it contains some sub energy. And I'm just curious to see like the frequency of this kick drum. So we could calculate that. Um, we just have to find uh, a cycle. So a uh, waveform that goes up and down. There's all this little texture here. That's just the high frequencies, like all the other instruments. But underneath all that is this very broad oscillation, right? That's the actual kick drum that's convoluted with all the instruments on top. So if we go and just measure, let's see, the, uh, the start of that, this one cycle. So this is, uh, let's see, so we zoom in. We'll say it starts right at the zero crossing right here. So that's at 995 milliseconds. And then we do one full cycle, 0 0.05. So that is 10 milliseconds. Now I found this website that'll actually do the conversion for us. So 10 milliseconds per period or cycle is 100 Hertz. So on a rough estimate, that initial punch from that kick drum is about 100 hertz, which is interesting because that's pretty high up, right? Most people think a kick drum is like 80 or 50 hertz. The reason I think this works so well, having that initial transient being so high, is that it resolves faster. So if you have a lot of fast kick drum hits, you can get separation of each of the individual drum transients without there being a lot of overlap. Because if you have a lower frequency kick drum, 
the wavelength is longer, so you need more time for it to complete that cycle. What's interesting is that kick drum also starts oscillating really fast, so it's like at that 100 to 120 hertz, and then with time, the wavelength gets longer and longer, meaning it's almost like a mini sub drop every time that the kick drum hits. So it's starting at 120 and going down to, by right here, 70 hertz, and it might even get lower here, probably down to about 50 hertz. Now that we understand a little bit about the frequency of the kick drum, this is interesting to me, because I don't know if this is just the nature of how the kick drum is interacting with the music or what, but you can see that after every one of these kick drums, we get um, this decrease right here in the level, the amplitude, right? There's this little valley here. What I think this might be is essentially like the release in attack settings of the bus compressor on this song. So the kick drum is triggering the, the bus compressor or whatever. It waits this many samples. So from 573 to 616. So it waits about 43 milliseconds. So it starts reacting to the music and decreases the volume of the track right here. And it holds it for 55 millisecond release time. So it's really short. And maybe this is like a limiter or something because of how quick that is. But it's just something that's interesting because if you really listen to the music, it has a lot of these micro dynamics where it feels like it's punching hard because it's actually turning all the music down immediately after. So your ears kind of jump to that and hear that and interpret it as a really powerful kick drum. So that's just uh, something I noticed. See, you can see it like all over this mix. Anytime there's a, a big transient burst of energy, you see that the overall average level of the song drops down. So interesting. I don't know if that's really what it is, but to my ears, I think it might have something to do with that. It's so good to hear Daryl's voice on stuff like this. Man, let me break this verse down a little bit for you. I'm just going to use this plugin because it has a really easy way to monitor the mid and side information. So the S stands for side and M stands for mid. I've turned the mix off so the plugin's not doing anything to the sound. And this is really helpful for kind of deconstructing the arrangement of this mix, okay? So let me just show you. I'll preview the side information. So this opening has, it's completely mono. There's no side information, right? We don't hear any of the talking. There's not even like a reverb or anything. There's no snare or kick drum in the sides, but notice you can perceive where the kick drum is because the volume is dropping. Especially like right here. So what does that tell us? Zach is side chaining his drum cymbals to the kick and snare drum. Or maybe just the kick drum. It's hard to tell if, it, if he's also doing it to the snare. So when the kick drum's hitting, a side chain compressor is pulling the level down of the cymbals and making them pump with the kick drum. And typically I do that when I wanna add a lot of clarity to the kick drum or make it really focused in energy because it gets all the other crap in the mix out of the way. Let's listen to all the elements that are in the middle now. Anything that's not mono in a mix, very common to roll off the low energy. And there's a few reasons for this. Some of it comes back to like the days of vinyl where you don't want stereo bass information or it can make your needle kind of jump in and out of the track and make it skip. Not cool, right? You spend all that money buying it, you don't want it to skip. Another reason to cut the bass out of the sides is that our ears don't really localize bass energy spatially, meaning that if you have anything about 80 hertz or below, it's hard for us to pinpoint where that sound is coming from. So to do a little bit deeper dive into what is actually on the sides, I'm just gonna use this plugin. Uh, again, it's not adding any sound to it. I'm just using it to preview the audio that's on the side that is below this number here, okay? So we're gonna be able to identify how low of bass frequencies we actually have on the side of this mix. Okay, and so I set that up by listening to just the side. So let's play the song. Okay, so we don't hear anything. Still nothing. 
Okay, I'm starting to hear a little bit of something. It sounds like maybe guitar cabinet resonance or something. There's a little bit of this like whoa, whoa sound. Um, and that's right around 100 hertz, okay? So that's pretty typical in a song like this to not really have any sub energy below like 80 hertz on the side. Let's keep going. There is another element that's being introduced in the chorus that wasn't there in the verse. So if you listen again, let's, let me put this on the side. There is this like, it almost sounds like a synthetic orchestra or violin or something. Yeah, that. It's doing this like nice little counter melody with the, the vocal. It's also extremely wide sounding. I think that was done intentionally because if you have elements that are artificially wide, um, it can give it a sense where the mix is almost surrounding your head. And we're at the chorus, right? We want to sound big and powerful, and that's a cool technique you can use, adding in an extra wide sounding element on the chorus to help give it that expansiveness when it hits. Especially on a track that is this dense, there's really not a whole lot more volume we can add before we're really gonna start just making everything turn into mush. So this is a really cool production trick that you can get more punch on your chorus without it sounding like crap. There's also a lot of like doubles that are stereo and really, really wide. So right here, you could kind of hear some of the vocals in the sides, right? And they sound like they're actually harmonies or maybe artificially generated harmonies. Like right there, there's like a triad, like a third and a fifth, it sounds like. So those screams that are in there, they're a lot louder than the, the vocal that we can barely hear. Those are ones that are going to be hard panned on the sides and that add a lot of width and like excitement to this mix. So this is a really cool transition here going into the second verse. We're adding in some contrast. Um, we're kind of taking away a lot of elements that are in the higher frequency register because we're going to have to build up to another chorus. We want it to hit hard, so how do we do that? Well, we can deconstruct the song a little bit and build it back up. So they've taken out the, the live drums or the, like the rock style drums and they replaced it with electronic kit. There's also this weird like synthesizer sound effect. Hang on, let me let me break this down. So again, let's listen to the sides. You can hear a lot of the electronic elements because they're not mono. Do you hear all these little ear candy pieces that are in here? Man, listen. And there's like this like wood stick clapping thing right here. So by changing up the song, by taking some elements away, putting in different textures by going to a more synthetic second verse, it's going to really build the contrast so that the chorus is going to hit really hard. I actually hear it like a click. Like it sounds to me like um, bad edit maybe. Yeah, right here. There's like a little click. Yeah, it's somewhere right in here. So yeah, I don't know if that was a bad edit or if it's just like something got clipped or if that's just a texture they're going for, but I don't know, be careful with your edits. <laughs> All right, so two important things I want to talk about this transition, okay? So we had this breakdown that kind of built back up, and we want to build it even harder into the chorus. 
So what did what did these guys do? They took a ton of the bass energy out of their mix. Right? There's nothing there anymore. But we're getting teased that something heavy is on its way because right here there's a big burst of subsonic energy. Listen. And now we're getting the the sub energy is coming in right here as that kick drum is kind of building up momentum. That was a cool transition. There's a, a few different like cinematic effects going on back here. Let me just uh, break that down really quickly. So if we listen to where Lil Uzi is has his verse, you'll notice that there's singing behind it that you might not have picked out. It's I think on the sides. Let's listen. Yeah, it's yeah. You can hear it a lot clearer on the sides there. And also, we get guitars coming in right here. Right, it's all synthetic. There's the guitar chug. And then you get these weird, like, bit crushed, crazy sound effects on a synthesizer that come in right here. And then you have this little, like, riser or swoosh thing that kind of modulates back and forth cool yeah this is all really good things to help build anticipation and excitement also notice that they dropped everything out after they built and built and built right here this is crucial for having this come in really hard okay so this is a great little production trick And it sounds like those synthesizers are getting louder on this chorus. All right, so this effect. Oh, this is really interesting. So I didn't catch this originally. So it's these hard stutters, this chop. So to do something that aggressive, you have to go to your master fader and literally automate the volume out because you have all these like effects and things. So it looks like what it's really doing here is instead of being a volume automation, it might just be like an EQ filter that gets everything above the sub bass and up. It cuts it all out because we get a little bit of these sub tails that are filling in the that void space, which I never noticed. <laughs> And that's actually a really cool trick. I've never seen that before. So I might have to experiment with putting in filters that just let a little bit of sub energy go through instead of using volume automation. Because it makes the kick drum feel more powerful this way. The kick drum's allowed to finish its like power cycle, if that makes sense. And then we can see all these really big waveforms here. This is either bass guitar or maybe a bass drop type sample that was put here to kind of bring everything down and then, because it's obviously building to something. Wow, there's so much ear candy, listen. So there's claps. Did I, I don't know if I even caught that on the first listen. Yeah, you can hear the, the claps back there. And like this weird eerie synth and this uh, bell, like a, like almost like a little finger triangle or something. I don't know. Oh, there's there's some more weird like chime sounds. And then you can hear a riser is now starting. I think that's centered in the mono channel. Yep. So yeah, you can hear the, the riser, right, to build intensity because we got a breakdown coming. Cool, let's listen to it in its entirety. Just let me breathe. Just let me breathe. Just let me breathe. 
I have a bunch of stuff to talk about. <laughs> it sounded like there's a volume automation going here to make this hit really hard. You can almost see or imagine the volume automation dropping down and then coming back up and then it jumps up to like full scale right here, okay? That is giving this part a ton of impact. There's also a ton of sub bass here that is side chained to the kick drum, it sounds like, because I can hear it kind of coming in and out as the kick drum's hitting. So here's a little uh, transition effect, it sounds like a ray gun. And then we have these like fun little like like church choir things, like oh. Bring the Horizon did this like 15 years ago in some of their early, early music where they had this like choir thing right before breakdown, which was sick. So it's kind of a fun like callback to like their really early music. I want to point one thing out though. When the kick drum starts going really fast, notice that the bass energy on the kick drum kind of goes away. Listen. Right, right here we have a lot of punch. There's impact every single kick hit. And we lose that right here. On the actual mix, it's either maybe an automation move or something, but it sounds like there's almost like a low shelf to kind of pull out the really sub bass on the kick drum for those fast parts, just to make sure that it doesn't get too bass heavy and lose the focus that the mix has. So this is the final chorus, right? We want to throw everything we have as a producer at it. And it, to me, I mean, maybe it's just really good volume management, but this sounds louder than all the other ones. It just sounds a little bit wider and, and more powerful. Let me just see what the volume, the loudness is on this chorus. This is the end of everything. Too late to So I think it's maybe slightly louder. Um, so I think it's just a little bit of a raise in volume automation on like the harmonies and, and anything that's on the sides. I love that. So by coming in and having the drums play twice as fast there, it kind of changes the feel of the chorus, makes it exciting, like you're looking forward to it. And then that way the song never gets stale. Cool, and then it goes right back, right before the chorus closes out to kind of bring you back home. It's like that familiar feeling that you've been listening to the whole time. Oh, that's cool. There's this downlifter that comes on this outro. It's like a, but it like flutters. That was a cool little like freeze effect. So that. That might have been a synthesizer, but if you want to make that effect, you can just take a small chunk of it and then duplicate that sound over and over and over, and it creates that kind of a buzzy square wave type sound. Like that. So that's just if you want to do that on your own productions, and you don't have a synth or anything. Again, a lot of cool ear candy here, making it sound like the world is ending. Yeah, this is classic Glassjaw sound right here. If you've never heard of Glassjaw and you want to check out some of their work, I actually remastered one of their old albums just to kind of celebrate the 20 year anniversary of it. So I'll put a link to that somewhere up here so you can check that out if you want. So let me know in the comments below, what did you think of this song, first of all? And then was there any part that I uncovered during this deconstruction process that you thought was really cool or interesting? I hope that me going through and picking out all the cool nuances to the song and maybe reverse engineering a bit of the mix is gonna help you make better sounding music. If you found this interesting or you make music yourself and you wanna go deeper into learning how to make really 
really, really aggressive, professional sounding music like this song. I have a ton, ton of tutorials in my YouTube channel. So go and spend some time looking through that. And be sure to hit that subscribe button because I drop new videos every single week that are gonna help you level up the quality of your music. With that, I wanna thank you so much for your time and attention today. My name is Bobby Balo. I'm the mixing and mastering engineer at Raytown Productions. And I hope to see you in another video.